Good. Okay, so welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron presented by BC Sports Hub and Dynamite Basketball. The purpose of Iron Sharpens Iron is to get at the art of creating culture, what it takes to become a high performer and what it means to be driven by purpose. We want to sharpen our tools by learning with and from others. My name is Broden Teal. I'm a certified mental coach who has a master's of education with a focus on positive coaching from the University of Missouri. And I'm the head of teams here at Dynamite Basketball. Today, our guest is Paul Eberhardt. He's entering his 39th year of coaching basketball and is eighth leading the Langara Falcons. Paul has coached at all levels of basketball, including high school, provincial team, national team, and in the CCAA. Coach Eve has guided the RC Palmers the ultimate title in BC school sports as they won a triple A BC championship in 2011. He then followed that up with back to back. Pack West titles in 2013, 2014. He led the Falcons to the first national championship in 15 years by reading Red Deer in 2014. Paul is one of the handful of coaches who has taken three different teams to the BC High School Championships, McGee, McNair, RC Palmer, and he has also guided the Capilano Blues to the BC Championship and the National Final Four in 2003. Coach Eve has been involved with the BC Elite uh, program, having been the head coach on 10 occasions, winning six Western Canadian gold medals and one national silver medal. Presently, Eve is the chair of the U-17 Selection Committee and is actively involved in helping to develop the BVC Elite program. He also had the opportunity to serve as assistant to Jay Triano and the men's national team from 2000 to 2004. Coach Eberhardt has received many honors in his career, including the Basketball BC High School Coach of the Year in 2007 and in 2011, Richmond uh, Coach of the Year in 2011, the Mike Pontiac, Jack, can, how do you say that? Pock and Jack. Pock and Jack, uh, Coaching Award of Excellence in 2007, the Rich Goulet Award for Outstanding Service to High School Basketball in 2019, Pac West Coach of the Year in 2013, 2014, 2017, Sport BC Coach of the Year in 2014, and the CCAA Men's Basketball Coach of the Year in 2013. That is a long resume, my man. Well, yeah, but you, you missed the one most important part of it. All yeah. that means is that I'm just really old at this point. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, let's. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Obviously, um, tough times here in the world, but we get to do fun stuff like this uh, in the, in the meantime. So uh, we just want to dive into it and learn a little bit from you. So can maybe if you can just start at, at the beginning, walk us through a little bit of your journey and how did you get involved with you know playing basketball and then obviously wanting to pursue coaching at a high level? Yeah, a long time ago. Well, I mean, my family was a basketball crazy family, uh, sports in general. My brother is an exceptional athlete, so. We played everything. He beat me in absolutely everything. Um, and uh, But basketball was kind of, you know, what our family loved the most. My dad, he played for McGee, actually. They won the BC title back in 1961. Wow. Um, my mom was like the head cheerleader for McGee, and that's how they met. And, you know, so uh, it was kind of always, I guess, destined that I think sports or basketball in particular was going to play a role for me. Um when I was in high school, I wasn't a great player by any stretch of the imagination. Um, like I said, my brother was really good. Uh, but I played all the time. I just loved to play. I loved basketball. And uh, so in my grade 12 year, um, our team was terrible, which was good for me because then I was going to get to play. Uh, <laughs> and, I and I broke my foot in three places, right literally at the start of the year. And so, you know, because in grade 11, uh, I didn't get to play at all, right? So, you know, I was so depressed. And the vice principal of the school, and uh, Harry Franklin, a, a longtime friend of mine and mentor coach of mine, you know, they said, hey, Eve, you, you, you know the game pretty well. You know, can you help out Mr. McIntyre? Because he's a vice principal, he doesn't have time. So I said, sure. Well, he never came. He was too busy. So I ended up, I ended up coaching that team. And I, I can tell you, honestly, I mean, I'm very lucky. I knew right then and there, this is what I want to do. Um, I made a plan ready, ready to go into, to get my degree in phys ed, to get a teaching degree and, you know, to get into teaching and coaching because it's what I love to do the most. So, yeah. So, you know, something negative happened to me, but I was very lucky to turn it into something very positive because, you know, I, I was not going very far as a player and I really found, um, I really found a passion and love in coaching. And, and literally since then, since I was 16 years old, I have, coached at least one team every single year since then. 
Wow. So let's just reverse a little bit. What's it like growing up in a household where, you know, there's an all-star athlete and then you're sort of the younger brother to that? <laughs> you learn uh, to be humble. <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think a lot of that is kind of where I got a bit of my work ethic. from. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we must have played thousands of one-on-one -on -one games. We had our own court in the backyard called an Eve Stadium, and we paint and loose. And we just played all the time. And I had to work so hard to get even close to him. And it would just piss me off because he would just turn a switch on and just go, okay, well, I'm going to beat you now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it just it taught me that, you know, if you want any chance at anything, you, you have to work your ass off and put a bunch of time in. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we had, and, and it was, a very, me and my brother had a very healthy rivalry when it came to all sports. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, in, in his own way, you know, because he was so much better than me, he actually, you know, helped me to get stronger too. So um, it was a very interesting dynamic for sure. I beat him twice though in wow. my life. And I remember both times. Once mm -hmm. was at UBC and once was in our backyard. And uh, I should have just quit when that happened and never played him again. Yeah. So we have a large portion of the people that, you know, follow us and, and that are, you know, in part of our program are from the Vancouver area, specifically McGee High School, right? So yeah. what, uh, what was McGee basketball like back in the day? So it was very interesting. McGee had been um, very strong, like back when my dad played back in the 60s. And then they were kind of, Basketball became fairly irrelevant at McGee. Mm -hmm. um, rugby really started to become a very big thing. They had an exceptional rugby coach there. Yeah. Um, and then in the late 70s, uh, they had a couple of really strong teams. And that was actually very, for me, because they made the BCs in 1979, and they were at the Pacific Coliseum. So I was grade nine. And that's when I, I mean, I'd heard all about the BC tournament. I mean, my dad's picture is in the wall of our basement of his team, right? But I'd never been to one. And I went to that, and, and that was – I just looked around, and I thought, oh, my God, I want to be part of this. It was one of the most amazing, you know, things I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, like, in, in, in like, 79. Um, and they came seventh that year. And then, you know, again, sort of kind of fell off the map. And then it wasn't – it was 1986 when I was in university. And out of the blue, I got a phone call from uh, Harry Franklin. Um, Pete Tyler, who was going to be coaching the senior team, had been transferred to Churchill. They had nobody to do the team, and he asked me if I would do it. Yeah. Now, I'd only been coaching for a few years, and I was like, senior boys? I'm, like, mm -hmm. I'm only like 20 or 21, right? Oh, yeah. but, I, but I took on the challenge, and uh, I was very fortunate. I had a very talented team. Actually, Mike Potkinjak's son, okay. he played for me, and that team made the BCs and did quite well. And That was my first year coaching senior, um, so had a lot of success right away. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we, we had the, the, the five, I coached McGee for five years and we were very strong for all five years, won a couple of city titles. Um, and then ironically, McGee kind of, you know, fell off the map again, high school wise. Mm -hmm. And the next time they made the BCs was when my brother yeah. went back and coached them. Um, and that was like, I think 2006 or seven. What was that and, like Hunter? Was that a guy's name? That's on? correct. Yeah. Yeah. Hunter Jordan. And, uh, yeah, there was Nick Taze and, yeah, you yeah. know, very good group. And my brother also coached Joey. Um, he coached Joey Haywood, of course, uh, in high school too. So, uh, yeah, so that group made the BCs again. And then, uh, looks like they took like another sort of 10 years off and, yeah. and now they were back making the BCs again this past year. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so they've had like a little bit of a resurgence the last couple of years, and it's obviously yeah. all been peaking for this year. Number two ranked in the province going into the season in AAA. So we're we're hoping for the best for them. Obviously, when when things come back, it's unfortunate we can't you know work with them all summer at the U17 level because mo that's where most of the guys are. But you yeah. got six 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 five, you know six four. They have a very strong front line. Okay, so back to your story. Um, so 1981 to 1985, junior boys coach at McGee. 1985 to 1990 how old are you at this time like because you said you were 21 <laughs> in 85 how no when i'm when i'm my first team i coached i was 16 okay and so the players are like 13 or 14 right so yeah, uh, yeah that was uh i mean that was one of the things you know and it, it, i had so many good mentors like i really did like it's so important to have that and harry Franklin, who was my teacher and coach mm -hmm. mcgee um uh and uh, Don McIntyre, the vice principal. Mm -hmm. And I had this unbelievable man, French teacher named Mike Keenly side, just an unbelievable man who kind of was my sponsor all the years for my teams. And so, you know, they were so helpful to me. Uh, and, you know, they reminded me like, hey, yes, you're really young, but you can't 
be the player's friends in that way. Yeah. And so I learned at an early age that you could be friendly with the players and have great relationship with them. But, you know, especially being that young, you had to make sure that, you know, that it, it was a distance relationship. And a per so, so I had good people to help me learn how to do that. Cause, and also too, I had great success. My first team ever coached won the city title, my mm -hmm. first team, the BCs. And, you know, I look back then and I think, man, I didn't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, Thank God I had such good players. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, at the time when you're young and you're doing, you think, oh my God, I know everything. I'm awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was so important to me to have this group of people around me who I could talk to and ask questions about and who were willing to help me all the time. It just made the biggest difference in the world. Yeah, that's such a valuable point. Like being a young coach, I, I even know it myself, you're trying to be so friendly, right? And we have, we have young coaches in our programs who are 19, 20 years old, and we're traveling on the road and things like that. And it's like, you have to establish that boundary. It's so important. Yeah, it's, it, it's critical, uh, because uh, otherwise, you, you know, you, you just you can't run the team properly. Yeah. And uh, you'll, you'll lose the players, not not intentionally, but you will for sure. Yeah. And so uh, after, you know, uh, what seems nine years here at McGee, uh, you decide to then move to Richmond. What was the reason for the move from McGee? Because I, I finally finished my degree. <laughs> okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> right, I was at UBC and I did my Bachelor of Phys Ed. And, um, you know, I didn't go, you know, like the first few years I was full-time. Then I, I just did part-time. I worked and I was, you know, honestly, I wanted to coach. Yeah. So I kind of put off finishing my degree on time because I wanted to coach. Yeah. So I finished my degree in 89 and finished my teaching in 90. So, you know, it was time to move on. And I was fortunate enough to get hired in Richmond mm -hmm. at J.M. Burnett um, part-time for my beginning teaching career. And so then I, I started coaching uh, the team at that school. Yeah, I remember when I first got my teaching degree and I was working at Saints and I was doing like the athletic intern role. I remember you guys specifically telling me, make sure you take care of your teaching first before you focus on basketball. And that's something that, you know, a lot of us young educators, we need that lesson, right? Yeah, because so often, I mean, it's such a passion for so many of us. We just love it so much that we do sometimes make decisions uh, that maybe aren't the greatest decisions in the world for, you know, for our balance and for our career, because, you know, basketball, we're so driven for basketball. So yeah, it's an important thing to remember that, you know, you can, you can, can be successful and do both, but yeah, you, you need to take care of, uh, uh, of, because, you know, sadly at Canada, we don't pay coaches here. Yeah. You know, it's not the U S right. So yeah. You know, if you want to be a high level high school basketball coach, you almost have to be a teacher. Um, so you've got to make sure you take care of that part first, for sure. Yeah, so first stop in Richmond is Burnett, followed by McNair. What kind of success are you guys uh, having at McNair? What, you know, you're sort of getting into your own there. What kind of stuff are you starting to run, and, and whose brains are you really picking at that time to develop your philosophy? So the, the first year I was at Burnett, um, I had an amazing team. These were some of Disbro's best teams. Yeah. Um, when I did the junior team there, uh, we were number two in the province, and R.C. Palmer, because we were junior highs, they were one in the province. Oh. And all of those players were going to go feed Bill, right? Yeah. At that's Richmond. Lewis. Lewis is at Palmer at that. Lewis is at Palmer at that time. No, this, this was the group with like Bobby Singh and Andrew Mavis and okay. Ben. May and I had Chris Lake and Andy Dunn. I mean, this was just is one of Bill's most talented teams ever when they all got together, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you know that was a, a very good situation. My principal moved to my principal that hired me at Burnett moved to McNair. Mm -hmm. And now there was only three high schools in McNair, Steveson, Rich, McNair. McNair didn't have much of a basketball history at all. Richmond High was just a dominant power and so was Steveston. And so he wanted to get basketball started there. So fortunately he was able to hire me and I moved over to, to uh, McNair to start the program there. And that, I tell you, that was a heck of a challenge. Yeah. I mean, it was the hotbed of basketball at the time. Now, it was a huge junior, a senior high, so I had a ton of players to choose from. But it was kind of all the leftovers that didn't go to Richmond, right? Yeah. So yeah. to establish a team there was really difficult, but we were able to do it. Um, you know, just getting kids to buy in, getting kids to understand what the program was about. And we had a very healthy rivalry with both Steveston and Richmond for like, you know, the next seven or eight years. Yeah. So what are you, what kind of like time and effort and hours are you putting in at the high school level at that time of your life? Oh, man, that was crazy. That was crazy. I literally would be at the school, you know, from – well, I'm not an early morning guy, so I think the first bell was like 821. I'd probably get there about 820. <laughs> but most – certainly most – and I was also athletic director, 
and I was involved with other leadership roles on the staff. And, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon for me literally to, to put in a, you know, 15 hour day, 16 hour day, mm-hmm. literally from eight, eight, eight till 10 at night kind of thing. Um, you know, but I was single at the time and I loved what I was doing. And, um, and so you don't really think about it when, when you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, I really wanted to establish a great program there. I wanted those kids to have the best experience possible. And, and to me, that's what it took. So that's what I did. Yeah, for sure. And all the while, are you um, starting to coach the provincial teams at this time? Yeah, I got I, I got very lucky. I got hired in 91. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to understand, Broden, back then, Super Camp was an amazing. There was no such thing as clubs back then, right? Yeah. Sure. And so super camp, it, there was camps like Marv Hirschman basketball camp and, you know, kids would go to camp and you'd stay overnight. Like that doesn't happen anymore. Right. Yeah. But super camps, literally you had the best 65 players in BC mm-hmm. coming from UBC or UVic where they would stay overnight and you would for like four days do basketball from, you know, nine in the morning till nine at night. Mm-hmm. And then after it ended, of course, that was for me the best experience because I just got to hang out with all these unbelievable coaches. I mean, here I am, you know, a young guy in my 20s, and I'm learning from Rich Goulet and Rich Chambers and Ken Dockendorf and Norm Bradley and Mike McNeil and Bill Disbro, all these guys who work. These guys all worked the camp. They weren't even necessarily the head coaches. Yeah. I, it was, I was so fortunate to have that experience. It, it shaped me immensely. And I got selected to be Goulet's assistant on the under-17 team. Wow. I just have to be a team with a certain guy named Steve Nash on it. So, yeah. I mean, what a, what a way to start uh, in, in provincial team stuff. So that's when I started, um, and I just loved it, and I've been involved pretty much ever since. Blake told me to ask you your Steve Nash story. <laughs> Which one? I don't know. He said, I make sure you ask him your Steve well, there's, Nash there's story. There's a couple of good ones. But, you know, Goulet, you know, I'm a young coach, right, and I've heard all about Goulet, right? Trust me, he's – when you work with him, he's nothing like what you're told he's like, right? Unbelievably generous guy and, and oh. really, really easy to work with and so giving. But, you know, he's a hard ass, right? <laughs> and he's hard on the players, right? Yeah. And so he was really hard on Nash. Um, they had this kind of thing going, right? Yeah. But they totally both respected each other because he was trying to make Nash better. So um, <laughs> he – Rich liked to do all these interviews with players to go over how they were doing and what they need to work on. And for some reason, he decided, like, 11 at night in Vegas for a tournament. That's the time where we're going to do it. <laughs> so we're doing Nash's interview, and, like, I'm sitting beside Goulet, and Nash is on the other side, and I'm falling asleep during it, right? Yeah. Nash is doing everything he can. Not, not, and so Nash starts laughing. Well, this just makes Goulet even more angry, <laughs> right? This is important. Why are you paying attention? And <laughs> Nash didn't sell me out, though. He didn't sell me out. He didn't <laughs> give me up. I was falling asleep during it. So, yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was uh, <laughs> that was pretty funny. Yeah. So Goulet is obviously, for those who don't know, absolute legend in this province. Uh, so many years coaching provincial teams. Pitt Meadows legend. Uh, I've had the honor to, you know, be on the provincial team on another team and travel with him. He's just an amazing guy, right? So, um, and then. Uh, you get hired at Cap in what ninety nine, I think it was. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the what's the transition from you know you being a high school coach and still remaining a high school coach? I think you're the hardest working coach in regards to that in the province's history. I would say coaching you know university now for so many years and then also high school at a very high level. Uh, what's it like your first season coaching both McNair and Capilano University all at the same time? Luckily, that, that, that year at Monero, I had a great guy coaching with me named Dougie Baxter, who, he, who took on a huge responsibility because he was a young coach, right? And he, he did a lot of it yeah. um, because I was trying to, you know, Cap had not had success in a long time. So I wanted to, you know, kind of turn that program around like I had done at McNair and at McGee. And, and so I, I spent a lot of time there. Plus, there was the whole commute thing going on at that time, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, luckily, I, I, and I had great assistance up at Cap, too. So that, that certainly helped, um, no question about it. Um, and the funny thing was is, you know, a lot of times as a high school coach, having an assistant is kind of a luxury. Mm-hmm. A lot of us don't have them. But because I was an assistant to Rich and some other coaches, it, I really learned a lot about how to use my assistant. Yeah. So many of us really, if we don't know how, we waste our assistants. And, boy, I got so much better at learning how to use my assistants. Yeah. And how to make them, you know, have a huge impact. So 
So I learned a lot just about how to, to juggle that and to trust them more. Yeah. You know, sometimes I can be a pretty dominating guy, right? Yeah. But I learned how to trust my assistants better. Um, and that made me a much better coach for sure. So what does that um, look like? What does that look like, trusting your assistants? Well, it, it, it literally means there was a time um, I had an assistant at McNair who uh, was really good, but a really kind of shy guy. And, um, and uh, so one time – I pretend that I was sick and couldn't go to a game <laughs> because I wanted him to do that. Right. Yeah. This, uh, uh, my buddy, John Acom, this he taught me this one. Right? And, and so, you know, but I would never have done that when I was younger. Cause I, went, oh, I can't, he's not going to do it the way I want it. For but sure. you, have to let, you just have to let go a little bit yeah. and then also learn what their strengths are and what your weaknesses are and let them jump in when you can. I mean, I still need to get better, mm -hmm. but you know, ultimately um, it's a matter of trusting them. Um, and also, like when you're an assistant, you have to know, like, I, I want, as a head coach, I want you to tell me a hundred things that I should do differently during a game. Just keep telling me and don't take offense if I ignore 99% of them. Mm -hmm. there, there's going to be that one or two things that are going to make a big difference. So, uh, you know, so sort of, and I learned that from being an assistant to Goulet. Yeah. Like I do suggestions, he just waved me off and tell me to shut the hell up. And yeah. but then, then he'd get one that he liked and you go from there. So. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important relationship that I think we need to learn how to do better as coaches because it's not something you get taught how to do, mm -hmm. and it's important. So you said on that opposite end of the spectrum, you've been the assistant coach where the coach is denying you so many times and you felt what that's like. Like, how do you keep coming at the coach with more and more and more information when you're getting denied and denied and denied? Well, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a trust thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a communication thing, right? Like your assistants have to know that you value what they're telling you. Yeah. And just because at this moment you don't want to use it, there could be a time where you do. Yeah. Um, a good head coach doesn't have that issue. Mm -hmm. You know, like if my assistants make a suggestion and, you know, and it works, I'm like, I'm not like jealous of that. I'm like, awesome. Like give me yeah. more. Right? So I, I just think, I, th I think if you have the right relationship with your assistant, um, then they need to know that, 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 it, that that's, that's the way it needs to be. Like you just, you help out, you do things. And you know, if I don't like it, fine. If I do like it, great. Yeah. So at your time at cap, obviously you had a lot of success. Um, one of the staples of the program, especially when I came into the program was that you guys were sending, you know, two year players onto university, one year players onto university. It seems mm -hmm. like that's sort of faded out of the college game a little bit more now, but that was definitely your model then. So how many players and, and how did you attract such talent and then send them off to the other school and keep that coming year in, year out? Coaching at cap was uh, difficult because it was a college mm -hmm. and they didn't have a lot of, degree programs yeah and so one of the things i knew early on um i wasn't going to be getting a lot of older guys there and i wasn't be getting a lot of fourth or fifth year guys there um so to me and because you know the the, the two-year the undergraduate diploma at cap is this is considered very good one mm -hmm. um that was the attraction like hey you want to play cis you're not ready yet either physically or your grades aren't good enough come play for me and we'll help you get there yeah. Um, nobody else was like, honestly, even back then, nobody else in, our, in the league was really doing that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm still the only one that does that. Yeah. Cause you know, you know like Gary's a college, we, you know, uh, I've had some fourth, fifth year guys, which I've been very lucky, but for the yeah. most part I don't. So it seems to me as a coach, like, yes, that player is a great player and it'd be great if he stayed and, and helped me win, but he's good enough to go play somewhere else and get a better school, school situation. So why would I hold him back? Yeah, it for seems to me it's my job to help them move on. And fortunately, I've got lots of good relationships with coaches across Canada. And, and so any player that ever tells me they want to move on, I, I do my best to do that for them. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. It, our, our league is not doing that anymore. Yeah. Um, with all that, because back then, too, you got to remember schools like Fraser Valley. and Thompson Rivers and Meet Trinity Western and UNBC, they were all in our league. 
Mm-hmm. They were moved up to CAS. That really changed the dynamic. So now the players you're trying to get are 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 looking to play at those places because it's CIS. So and most of the schools in our league now are all full universities. So yeah. you just don't see that happening. But I I still try to do that because I think it's important. Um, and uh, you know right now at the university level, coaches are really trying to reach down and bring in American players, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but I still think that our league can help players develop over one or two years and, and then can push them to move on. I think that's important. Um, so while I was playing you, with you or for you at CAP, um, we had developed the system based around like the Phoenix Suns, like the quick shot clock, all that stuff, sure. run and gun. Um, and is that something you were always running from the get-go or is that something you sort of picked up along the way? My first few years coaching, um, you know, I was coaching the younger teams at McGee. Uh, I had some bigger guys. And, you know, back then, you're, you're kind of, you're really inexperienced. And you're also, you know, you're self-conscious, right? So I wanted to have complete control. Yeah. <laughs> so I ran a really slow system. Let's walk it up. Let's pound it in. And we had some success. And, you know, it was fine. But the more I started coaching and watching and seeing and just talking to players, the more I realized that, you know, that's really not the funnest way to play. Yeah. Players want to get up and down the floor. Everyone wants to score, touch the ball and run. So I slowly started evolving into running a much more fast break style, which I started when I did the senior team. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started doing that. And then uh, again, uh, I would say in the early nineties, I got a chance to meet Paul Westhead. Mm -hmm. Um, And because that was when he was at Loyola Marymount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that crazy stuff. And that was one of the most influential things for me because I took his system. You know, as you know, we call it the system, right, just like yeah. he does. And I took his system completely. And then I adapted it and changed it. And, you know, I've changed it over the years as, as basketball has changed, you know, especially lately, you know, with the emphasis on way more spacing and all these other things. But I still, to this day, run basically that system with a few adaptations. So, yeah, for the last, you know, 20, 24 or five years, that's the way, you know, we've played. Yeah. Um, and, and I love it. I, I think, you know, there's always a big, like you had Disborough on the other day. Well, Disborough yeah. systems, no. Yeah. He doesn't believe it, right? It's, that's not, he thinks that's bad, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he wants to pe- players to just become all-around players. Well, I, I've always believed in a system, and I, and I think if, if you learn how to run an effective system – Players have to be able to, to play anyway. Yeah. Sometimes you don't always have the most talent, right? Yeah. You don't. And if you just go out there and ball and just kind of roll the balls out and play, mm-hmm. if you don't have talent, you're not going to win. Mm-hmm. So you've got to do some things as a coach to hide your team's weaknesses and try to maximize you know, what they do well and try to come up with ways that you can beat teams that are better than you. And, and I think if you get guys to buy into a system that works – um, I think you have that opportunity to do that. Yeah, so you're saying a lot of the pros about the system that you run. What are the weaknesses of the system that you run? Well, okay, so so um, it can be a bit predictable mm-hmm. um, running running a system like I run because I've always found uh, when I would play teams the first time and they'd never played us before or seen what we did, we had a lot of success. But then sometimes the more you played them, uh, and they got used to what you did. They made the proper adjustments. And, and so it can be a little bit predictable at times. Yeah. Uh, some people might argue that a system can pigeonhole players. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily believe that because I think players have to be multidimensional within the system mm-hmm. and play different spots. But that's, that's a fair criticism about, you know, when you run a system that sometimes that might – players might not be able to – you know, maybe uh, expand as much as they'd like to. Although I, you know, I would argue that, but that that, yes. that would be another criticism of it for sure. For sure, uh, pros and cons to obviously running everything. There's so many different ways to do it, right? And you, you just got to go with what you trust and what you think is the best at times, right? Well, that's the beauty of basketball, though, right? Like you see coaches that are up and down, running up and down, yelling, screaming, like I do. <laughs> you see coaches who are just completely chill and mellow, like you know. John Wooden was, or you know, and you can be successful doing it any way that you want. You can run a high octane fast break. You can run super physical, grind it out defensive bang guys. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can run a great sets on offense. You can run pick and run. I mean, you can pick and choose and do anything and be successful at it. I think ultimately, though, this is what I would say: if you're not being real, in other words, if you're not being truthful to who you are. 
yeah. and you try to run stuff, your players won't buy it. Yeah. They have to know that you believe in it, yeah. right? And they have to know that you're genuine, right? That's so critical. If you're going to go rip a guy because you think he's made a mistake, Right? Or you think you know that, and and he thinks you're doing it for ego reasons or to try to embarrass him. Um, then that player is not going to play for you. Mm -hmm. If you develop a relationship with them and they understand that you know that's just your style and you're trying to get them to become better, mm -hmm. and that's why you're criticizing them, then they'll play their butt off for you, right? Yeah. So there's so many different ways to do it. But if you try to be somebody you're not. Yeah. And early in my coaching career, I, I looked at other coaches and thought, oh, I got to try that or I got to do that. And I just found that if you do that, your players will see it and they won't respect it. You have to be who you are. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that. And, and it doesn't matter who you are, but you have to be genuine. If you are, you're in good shape. Yeah. So let's get back to the timeline a little bit here. So uh, you're sure. obviously you're at Capilano College. Uh, yeah. like we could talk basketball all night, but I have to get to <laughs> Hour, right so yeah, I got um, you. so in the timeline um basically we're at cap right now so you're at cap you're talking about the system how you can surprise some teams um i remember specifically the year before i got there a story of you guys beating douglas college undefeated the entire year national champions that year or was it right. yeah so just talk about that game a little bit and how the system worked in that game that was a really cool team because i didn't have anybody in that team that was over six four um, it was mostly all guards, guys who I'd coached for a while. Um, I, I had a kid named JP Command who was the only all Canadian I had when I was at Cap. And he was 6'4 and he played power forward, center. <laughs> he played pretty much every position for me. Um, that was a great group of guys who, you know, we weren't super talented. I mean, I think we finished that year, I think we finished 500 in the league. I think we were 8 and 8, came uh -huh. in like fourth uh -huh. place. But, you know, when we played, uh, when we played Douglas on that specific night, I mean, the system worked to perfection. They mm -hmm. took us a bit lightly, um, but we shot a lot of threes. Before shooting a lot of threes was popular, we, we, we would shoot 40 or 50 a game. Wow. And this was, at a, this was at a time when, you know, teams were maybe shooting 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. So we, anybody that had big guys, like, they had to come out and guard us, mm -hmm. which created all kinds of opportunities for my other guys, Nick Taze and Rosie and these guys. And so, yeah, that was a pretty cool night. We beat them at the buzzer. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we ran a play that, you know, that I thought might work. It was a little counter to flex and we scored a layup and that was pretty cool. Uh, and that was, Chris, that was, Chris that was yeah, that's right. It was offered. Yeah. 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 Good yeah and you, know, you know what sucked is in the celebration after we won, offered man's on somebody's foot. Oh. And then we lose them for like the rest of the year after that. <laughs> oh, man. It was brutal. That's brutal. We, I had some guys on that team, guys who just you know weren't even great basketball players, but were perfect role players. Yeah. And they knew what their role was, and they accepted it, and they flourished at it. And, and I think if you can make your players understand that, mm -hmm. um, to accept and understand their role, uh, you're going to be way ahead and beat teams that are much better than you. Okay, um, so moving forward, we just the you know you're at Cap at this time, but also while you're at Cap, there's something brewing at the high school that you're now at, RC Palmer. So I just wanted to run this off for you: 2008 Senior Boys Final Four AAA, 2009 fifth place AAA Provincial Championship, 2010 second in AA Provincials, and 2011 uh, AAA Provincial Champions. 2012 Richmond champions. Like, how do you do that run all the while coaching a college team at the exact same time? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I transferred to Palmer, um, and I wasn't even sure if I was going to coach high school anymore. And I took a grade eight team, like in 2003, and just fell in love with this team. Yeah. You know, we unexpectedly won a Richmond championship. I don't know how still to this day. I had one player, mm -hmm. Eddie Farron. Eddie won Listen, we won the finals. Yeah. By a score of 39 to 35, and Eddie had 35 of our points, okay? Wow. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, so, so I moved up with them and yeah. then took them on at senior. So when I started with them at senior, I, wasn't, I, I was just finishing up at, Lang, at Capilano. Um, uh, but when I went, but then I, I stopped at Capilano in 2009. So I did have a couple of years of, you know, just one team, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, we, we established, you know, again, Palmer had been a power in junior high. And then when everything changed to, to, to 8 to 12, Palmer fell off the map in basketball. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, you know, again, I just starting with this group, you just, I think if you just preach the right things, you preach work ethic, you preach responsibility, you know, and you work hard on those things. And ultimately as a coach, you want to get them to love basketball. Yeah. Uh, because then your work is done. Like, as I told you at the start of this interview, I'm a terrible early morning person. I admit it. I, I can't get up early, but I, my guys would be at the gym at seven in the morning. Yeah. They bribe the custodian to open the gym because they wanted to play. And I think if you can create that culture, just mm -hmm. that loving to play and having fun playing with your friends, yeah. um, then I think so much more takes care of itself. And that's what we we're able to establish at Palmer. And yeah, we won eight consecutive Richmond championships, which still blows my mind to this day. Yeah. And then of course, uh, you know, in 2011, we had that, that special group that, you know, when they're in grade eight, I thought that group might have a chance. Um, and, uh, and they did. And, uh, you know, what was cool about that is, is that was a 50 year, 50 year anniversary of my father's team winning it, uh, at McGee's wow. and, and they were all there except that there was one player on the team that had passed, but their whole team was there to celebrate their 50th anniversary of their title. And, and my team went out and won it. So uh, really, really special, special mm -hmm. night. You know what? Uh, being around that at the time, like we played, we at Cap, we would practice there, and it doesn't surprise me that you guys had the success based on how many kids were just hanging around all the time and just wanting to play, lifting, shooting in the other gym. And I remember stories about like Zayas telling me like he hid one kid would hide behind the bleachers, wait for the janitor to leave, and then they'd open up the gym and all this stuff. Um, but how did you build that culture when you first get there? And how do you cultivate that uh, for that successful run? Well, I mean, I, I think you just, like, like I said, you need to be, you, you need to be genuine. You obviously have to work hard, but um, if you can get them to buy in and get them to see the value of it and get them just, to, they have to, a lot of people see me coach and they see how hard I am. And they say, Oh my God, how can I ever play for that guy? I mean, look at him, Right. But, you know, you know this because we, me and you, how many classes did we have, right? Like, you know, you know, we went at each other, right? Okay. But, but in the end, players respect the fact that you care enough, mm -hmm. that it's important enough to you that you're investing in them, mm -hmm. that they want to invest back. Yeah. Um, and if, if you can make it as fun as you can, especially off the court, right? That's where a lot of the really good relationships and fun happens. Yeah. But if they're doing it and having fun – that's that's the battle because then they're going to come back and want to keep playing and they'll play hard for you and they'll work hard for you because they're enjoying it. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I did a grade eight team at West fan uh, two years ago because I transferred out there. Right. Yeah. And so we, we took 15 kids on the team. Well, last year I moved up when those grade nines and we had of those 15, 13 wanted to keep playing. See, it, and we weren't even necessarily that good, but to me that, that says a lot, right. Right, the fact that they thought enough of that experience, enjoyed it enough that they want to come back and keep playing. And I think that, as simple as that sounds, if you want to build a program, that's what you need to do. Yeah, for sure. We'll get back a little bit to the provincial title uh, championship and everything like that later. Sure. I got a little surprise for you, but we'll get on but to that. that later. Um, but then you transfer to, to Langara uh, eventually. What's it like, you know, all of a sudden being at Langara? And I, and I know. Um, there was a strong team before you got there and then, and then carrying that on. Well, you know, I, I, again, it was a surprise to me. It wasn't something I thought I was going to get back into. Mm -hmm. I live five minutes from Langara mm -hmm. and the AD Jake at the time, he, he had been doing both AD and coaching, but he had decided he couldn't do both anymore. Um, and so we just had a conversation about it. And the more I thought about it, I knew a lot of players on that team. I had a couple of my Palmer kids on that team and it was a great team. And I thought, man, you know, yeah, maybe I'll try myself with this team. I think we could be pretty good. And so I, I decided to take that job back on. I'm so glad I did uh, because, I mean, not only did I have a lot of talent, but just a, a really special group of guys too. And um, so I was able to walk in there. And, and again, I, I just, I wanted to set an expectation. The very first meeting I had with that team, I just said, you guys are going to win a national championship. Yeah. You have the talent. I said, I, I, you know, any of you who've played for me before, you know, I don't bullshit. Like, mm -hmm. if I think you're good enough, I'm going to tell you, you guys are good enough. And so we just set that standard from the beginning. That, that was the standard that we wanted to try to aspire to. Um, and again, there was a lot of talent on that team. And I asked guys to buy in to maybe lesser roles than the, what they might have expected. Mm -hmm. And they all bought in. And, um, you know, as a result, uh, you know, we were able to, lucky mm -hmm. enough to 
to get a national title in our second year after an absolutely brutal loss in our first year mm. in, the, in the semifinals. One of the worst losses of my life. Yeah, uh, we lost to Holland College uh, basically at the buzzer, and it was just a. Uh, but the guys had enough that they remembered that, and they came back the next year and we got it. So, uh, yeah, and so you know we've established a pretty st- and like Gary's had a strong tradition forever. For sure, know, Kevin Hansen was successful there. Jake's father, Dunk McCallum, is a Hall of Famer that coached there for years, and um, you know then Jake coached there, uh, Novell Thomas coached there, mm-hmm. Simon Bencher. So it, it has been a long tradition. It's been a while since we'd won it, so I was happy, really excited that we were able to do that. Yeah. So how do you motivate a group um, with a tough loss, like you're saying? How do you motivate them to come back the next year and and to win the national championship? What does that look like? Well, I mean, I think it makes you hungry, right? When you get that close and you don't succeed. Um, two things can happen. You can quit or you can get hungrier. And I had a group of guys with a character that were pissed off about it. And, hey, we're not going to let this happen again. The same thing happened with my Palmer team. We lost in the finals of the 2010 Double A Championship to Britannia, a team we'd beaten by 20. Yeah. And they thumped us in the final. Yeah. Um, and, you know, our whole reason for being the next year was, you know, to make sure that we learned from that. And, uh, and we did. So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes those brutal losses – Sometimes any losses, you actually learn way more from those than you do quite frequently from winning. So as the, the leader and the, and the lead voice of the program, are you reminding the individuals about last year or is it just well, sort of in like an unspoken word? I think it's a bit of an unspoken word. However, there might have been times at a practice or two where I didn't think they were practicing hard enough where I might have reminded them about it a little bit. You know, just as a That's- little extra motivation. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, Demi was just asking, he sent a question on here. He said, "How? when's the last time you ran a set of lines? <laughs> the last time I ran a set of lines, the truth is, it was actually at CAP, so that's got to be over 10 years ago. Yeah. And I remember it too. It might even have been his team. Yeah. I, I lost a bet and I had to run a set of lines. And but by the time I was done, the entire girls team and volleyball team were over there cheering me on and I, I think I belly flopped across the finish line, but I made it. Yeah, was that before or after you made us do 47 suicides in 47 minutes? <laughs> uh, I, I think that's an exaggeration, but I don't know if I remember that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, so what are some uncompromisable things, like, as a leader that you would have in your program and some things that would you would never bend from? Well, you know... <sighs> I mean, I, I think, as I said before, I think you have to be true and be genuine to who you are. Um, and you know what? You have to own your you have to own your mistakes too. Mm-hmm. You really do, right? I, I I see sometimes younger coaches they they try to alibi like or push it, but you know what? If you screw up, you got to tell your team that, right? Yeah. You have to own you have to own your 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 failures mm-hmm. um, because again, then they see you as being genuine. So I, I think that's something that you just have to uncompromise. You have to be that way. Um, and, you know, I think when it comes to your players, there's an old adage that says you, you don't treat everybody the same, mm-hmm. but you treat everybody equally. Yeah. It makes sense, right? Different players require different things. Some players need to be yelled at. Some players need to be called a little bit. You know, some players need to be be told the truth when they don't want to hear it some players you have to build up so you're not going to treat everybody the same but you're going to treat everybody equally and fairly right mm-hmm. uh, you know I, I think sometimes as coaches you know we have like these hard and fast rules on things mm-hmm. and i've learned over the years that that's not necessarily the best way to go yeah. i think you have okay here's our philosophy here's what we want you to do and then when players stray outside of that you have to follow through on it but if you set a hard and fast rule, for example, like, hey, if you are late for any reason, you don't get to play, right? And then, you know, a player comes late and you don't follow through with that, you're going to completely lose your team, right? Yeah. So you just have to be honest and straightforward and, and be who you are. I think that's something that you – it's really important as a coach. So what are some things that, like, obviously you had learned over your coaching career? Because, like – you're talking 38 years co- coaching at all different levels. What is the most important thing you did when you were younger that you've transitioned out of now that you're older, like that you're <laughs> more. <experienced? laughs> well, 
Listen, I think uh, the the folly of life in many ways is when you're younger, mm -hmm. you have all the energy, you have all the passion, you you know you die, you know you, you've got all this, but you don't necessarily have all the the experience and knowledge. Yeah. So then, as you get older, you get that experience and knowledge, but you can't physically do the things you could do when you were younger. Yeah. So I, I, I think yeah. so. I, I think one thing I learned from when I first started coaching is number one, um, I had to become way more patient. I was way. I mean, I, it's players will tell you that's still a problem for me now, yeah. um, but you have to become more patient. Um, and because it's all about like anybody that's involved in this for the most part is a competitive human being and you want to win. Mm -hmm. Right. But you can't be completely stubborn. When I was younger, I was much more stubborn about things. I didn't really listen to others as much as I should have, you know, because I just was so driven. Um, I would tell my younger self, oh, listen, yeah. because, because as you do that, you just become so much better. So mm -hmm. yeah, more patience, uh, less stubbornness. And I think the other thing is, is you have to compromise better. Uh, I think when I was younger, I didn't compromise as much on things because I was just convinced that my way was the right way. Yeah. Um, as you get older, you realize, man, there's lots of other ways mm -hmm. that you can do things. And as a coach, I think one of the most valuable things you can do is literally steal from everybody. Yeah. Like the number of coaches that I've stole things from over the years, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily, you know, technical and tactical, but just philosophy wise. And I've tried to see if it would work for me. Keep yourself open to those things. And that's what I would tell my younger self. I didn't do enough of that. Yeah, for sure. So on the dichotomy of like being a player's coach or being like a tactical coach, where do you see yourself on like the sliding scale? Well, I've always thought a bit of those comparisons are, are kind of bullshit to be honest with you <laughs> because you can be both. Why can't yeah. you be both? What does it mean to be a player's coach? I, I think it means that you listen to your players, you respect your players and they respect you. Mm -hmm. You push them to be the best they can be. I think that's being a player's coach. There's this misconception that a player's coach just is kind of chill and I'm like your buddy and here, go shoot and do what you want. I, I don't think players want that. I think players want direction. I think they're willing to take direction and discipline. They want it. So I think you can be both, um, you know, in terms of technical and tactical stuff, I, I think I'm pretty good at that. I think it's something I worked hard to get good at. Um, but I think you, I, I really think, I mean, maybe I'm being unrealistic, but I really think it's not one or the other. I, I think you can be both. Yeah. Um, I think the tactical stuff, honestly, is the easiest part. Mm -hmm. right? Because we can all go to clinics. We can all listen to others. We can all see things on film of how they will work, right? But the relationships are the complicated part. Yeah. They're, they're the part that is a coach – it's easiest to screw up. And so that's the one you got to spend most of your time on, I think. And, and the reason I asked that question is so we can get quotables like you just gave us. So there you go. <laughs> okay. I like it. Okay. So I'm going to show you some pictures. I just want you to give a response of what, what you're thinking and what you, uh, oh God, what you, what have you found? What comes to your mind. All right. <laughs> wow. That was a, a, a very happy moment for me. That was the moment we won the national championship. Uh, Lloyd Strick for Red Deer had hit four threes in like, I don't know, like 23 seconds. Um, and uh, they had one last chance and they turned it over and we won. And so that was the exact moment. Paul Yates captured that photo for me. That's a very cool photo. Yeah, very cool. That's photo. at uh, West University, no longer in the, in the any, anywhere to be seen, right? No, nowhere to be seen, but that was a, a great moment up at the Kermode Cave for sure. Yeah, man, look at that beard, eh? <laughs> I didn't. I told the guys I wouldn't cut it the whole season until we won. So that was a full season's worth of growth there, yeah. and that was uh, that was right after winning the the 2011 title, and that was a very emotional moment for me. I have to tell you, I I always thought because I always visioned that would happen. I didn't, didn't know if it would, but I I visualized in my mind so many times, and. I thought the moment we won, I'd be like Jim Valvano, right? And I'd just be running everywhere, all over the court, yeah. losing it. And I just started crying as soon as we won. It just, emotion just overcame me. So that wow. was pretty, yeah, that was pretty cool. Wow. Oh, that's the boys at Palmer. Yeah, that's uh, that's the group. Uh, that's the group. If you look right behind me, there's Joey Dillon. He's right next to VJ. Mm -hmm. And Joey has been my assistant for the last two years. Um, and he's going to become a teacher. And I tell you what, he's going to be a great coach. And how, uh, your high school team and how many of these guys play college? Uh, 
all of them except for Joey. They all played, yeah. and they all did very well. Yeah. But Joey's on the coaching side, so it's all good. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. I can't believe you found that one. That was my first year, and that's the last time I didn't have facial hair. So that's 1991. 1991, my first year uh, at McNair. Um, and we played Richmond High. And back in the day, I, I used to kind of be famous for wearing a hat. And the reason I had the hat on is because I'd been golfing that day. <laughs> and I had the golf hat on. And then we played Richmond High that night, and I just kept it on. And they were like number one or two in BC. And we lost like something like – this is when I first instituted the crazy Paul Westhead system. So we lost like 126 to like 102, right? So it was a very entertaining game, and, and the reporter at the game wanted to get a picture of me with my hat on and stuff. So, yeah, that's what that was from. What do you got to say about that tie? so skinny in that picture. Oh, my God. <laughs> what do you got to say about the tie? I still have that tie. That's one of my that, – that, that looks like that's my Las Vegas tie. I still have that one. I, I, I've got a very good collection of ties that I'm sure you've seen many times. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun. So um, Thank you. just – what you're, what, what are you trying to leave? You know this game with now. You've had 38 years coaching. You've won provincial title. You won the national title. What are you trying to accomplish in the next couple of years? And what do you, what do you think your legacy will be? And what do you feel like your purpose is? Jesus, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, truthfully, every year that I coach, my goal is to win a championship. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my goal every year. Um, it happens far less. Than, it, than you want it to, but ultimately that's the joy in it, right? You try to achieve whatever level it is that team or group of people you're working with can achieve, you try to achieve that. You shoot for perfection. You almost, well, you never get there, mm -hmm. but the joy is seeing how close you can get. Um, and then when that year ends, if you don't win a championship, it doesn't really matter. Like it's irrelevant to that point. You just say, okay, did we do everything we could to be as successful as we could? Um, and, you know, if the answer to that is yes, more often than not, then, you know, then, then that's really what you're doing it for. Mm -hmm. um, so my goals haven't changed. I'm still really competitive, and I still want my teams to, to be as successful as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that ultimately is what we're trying to achieve in this game. Um, you know, I, I, legacy, I, I don't know. That's for others, I think, to discuss. Yeah. I don't even really know what it means, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think ultimately if – if I can make a difference, if I can make a positive difference in young people's lives, then then really uh, what better legacy is there than that, right? For sure. I think it was, I don't know, this was probably about 15 years ago. I was at a BC Lions game, and a guy tapped me on my shoulder, and I turned around, and I recognized him. It was one of my players from McNair, so it would have been, you know, like back in the early 90s. Um, and, and we had a good chat, but he said something interesting to me, which really had an impact on me. He said, you know, he said, Eves, you know, one of my most favorite memories was this is oh, because this guy wasn't a very good player. Like he was like 12th man. He never played. And uh, I said, oh, it must have been when you scored in the home opener in front of 400 people. And they all, he said, no, no, no. I said, oh, was it the trip to California? No, no. I said, well, what was it? He goes, oh, was it a practice? I said, really? I said, what happened? He says, you, you ripped me. I said, what? I said, yeah, I was having a terrible practice and I was being a baby. And he says, you just ripped me. And I said, oh, geez, I'm sorry. And he's like, no, you don't understand. He said, as soon as you did that, I knew I belonged. Because that's what you do to the best player, too. Yeah. And I just thought to myself, wow, you know, that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, really, that's what you're hoping for. You're hoping that you can have some sort of positive influence that will help somebody, um, you know, be successful in whatever they choose to do later on. And uh, and coaches and teachers, I, I sometimes we don't – I think we're too humble sometimes because the difference we make is immeasurable. It mm -hmm. really is. Um, and you don't really know it until you run into somebody like I did there. What happens to you is you get older and you hear the impact that you had. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're doing it the right way and with, for the right reasons, you, you can really seriously impact people's lives in a positive way. And ultimately, that's what you want to do. That's what it's about. Yeah. And isn't it a testament of how many weddings you get invited to or something like that? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that's true. Oh, my God. Because I learned, I've learned, when I get invited to my East Indian players' weddings, I learned a long time ago that you don't go to the beginning or you're going to be there for like seven hours, right? You just go to the reception after and have all the drinks, yeah. yeah. No, it's very true. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, that's a cool thing. You get that opportunity a lot, especially yeah. as you get a little like I am.
Yeah. So is there anything else you want to say before we uh, move on here? No, I just, I really enjoyed this. And, 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 you know, I, in this time that we're going through it, and I think it's cool that you're, you're doing this and providing this service to give people something to look at. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I, you're a pretty good story too, Brody. I, I think uh, people probably don't know what a good story you are. Uh, I never you, get to tell the story. Yeah, but you're the type of player that I'm talking about, right? I mean, let's be honest, right? You, you know, basketball has done immeasurably positive things for you and it's become your career now. Right. And um, I don't think a lot of people would have ever guessed that would have been the case with what you went through where you came from. Right. And yeah. um, so, you know, I mean, look at yourself as an inspirational story for lots of others to look at too. So I yeah, just, uh, sure. I'm really proud of you. Just, just on that note. So it's not like a big bro moment here or anything. <laughs> you know, I was a high school dropout and I never played high school basketball. And I remember really? showing up, you know, sending you emails and things like that. And you were always responsive. And it was sort of like the, you know, you're the 28th guy on the email list type thing. And it's like, <laughs> you go through the whole summer, just grinding it out in practice. And all of a sudden it's like, you're, I remember it. I remember it vividly. Practice and being like, am I on this team? Like pulling you aside and you're like, this is the first week of practice. You're definitely on the team. And I just remember being like so ecstatic, right? So thank you for changing my life. Uh, no problem, bro. You, uh, you did it yourself, brother. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and obviously, it's been an honor having you on here. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest staples in basketball, BC. And uh, we're so grateful for you giving your time and, and talking about this, all your successes and all your learning experiences and all that stuff. And we just we just hope for the best for you in the future and in all endeavors. Uh, and this will go up on um, on YouTube, and so you'll be able to watch it, or other people will be able to watch it. Um, but it will cool. be on here for 24 hours, so check it out cool. uh, on YouTube on BC Sports Hub after this. Uh, and we're going to be doing this every night at seven until you know they allow us back in the gym. So that's uh, that's a great. <laughs> Thanks so, a lot. Bruce.